I also want world fame as a good introducer. Be careful um, not to insult me there. No. <laughs> go for it. So, the stage well, is yours. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Today we have Kasper Gudik and Beck from Leiden telling us about their new paper with, together with Bedran, who's also here. A bit of context. Um, Kasper got his bachelor's degree in both math and computer science in Amsterdam, where he also did a master's later with a focus in algebra and geometry. Since January 2019, he's a PhD student in Leiden at Laix slash Aqua with Vedran. Mm -hmm. And as he'll tell us today, he's done some research on the complexity theory and quantum algorithms and before also the applications to machine learning and topological data analysis, which was very cool. So yeah, without further ado, kick it. Very good. Uh, thank you, Elias, for the uh, introduction. Uh, so today I'll be discussing a paper, or in more note, on establishing separations between classical and quantum learners uh, with classical data. So we restrict ourselves to classical data in such, in this case, and we, we really focus on two main questions, and it's sort of how to properly formally define what we mean by a separation. There's also already some challenges there. And then the second part is really what are the required ingredients for such a separation. The archive number is right here. Um, so, despite effort by a, a rather large community, um, only contrived examples of learning separations are known for classical data. They're uh, more on the side of, uh, of quantum data, but really for classical data, it's only contrived cryptography and spider data sets. And, and for me, there's, there's two problems that I encountered when sort of studying this, or we encountered, is that it's already quite cumbersome to define what we mean by a learning separation. Uh, for instance, let's just sort of give an intuitive example here. Consider a family of functions, uh, or later we'll call them concepts, but for now, just think of them as functions, uh, where each of the functions is classically intractable, yet quantumly efficient. And let's assume for now, this also holds even in the presence of data. Then we can consider two scenarios or two settings. One setting is where we're given a set of evaluations of these functions. And we are asked, or one of the functions, I mean, so really for one J, we are given evaluations. And we are asked to evaluate this J concept or this J function on some X we have not seen before, on some input we have not seen before. But there's also the other setting where we are again given a set of evaluations, but instead of having to evaluate, we are asked to identify which of the functions uh, generated the training set, generated the set of evaluations. And by our assumption that the functions are classically intractable yet quantumly efficient, in setting one, there's a separation. No classical learner will ever be able to evaluate these concepts because they were classically intractable from the get-go, even given a set of examples. However, in setting two, this is entirely unclear. So the, the challenge here is really trying to find out how to formally define it such that you can differentiate between these two settings and say, what is the, the, the learning setting we're actually after here? And I assume that the functions are from some concept class, right? I mean, that's known what type of function you are. Yes, having. correct. Yes, the, the functions are known a priori. Yes, they were the, the, they're a known concept class to the learner a priori. Wonderful. Um, however, when given the examples, you don't know which of the concepts generated. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm not calling them concepts yet. Concepts will become later to, when I'm defining them. Um, and the second setting is that proving them, the pr second problem is that proving them are actually rather cumbersome. And um, sort of from a complexity theory perspective, which we take sort of in this note in this talk, is that there's two issues here. One issue, uh, if we want to verbatim translate complexity theory results, is that access to data can radically enhance the power of a classical learner. Um, which in machine learning, this is the case, but typically in complexity theory, we're not given uh, access to data. Moreover, in the more standard areas of complexity theory, we studied the worst case complexity. Whereas in machine learning, all we care about is being approximate correct. So correct on a fraction of possible inputs. And the talk is built up in two parts. The part, first part, I'll deal with problem one. And the second part, I'll deal with problem two. And then the first part, we're fortunate enough to be able to build on the computational learning theory of the 90s, set forward by Karen Vazrani. Um, where we can learn from how they set up their definitions and try to translate this into the quantum realm as well. And then the second part, we sort of look at the existing examples of separations 
And we try to generalize the techniques that they've used to overcome sort of this specific challenge here, or these two specific challenges that arise when proving such a separation. So without further ado, let's move on to part one. And I'd like to reiterate here, we study supervised learning. Uh, the generative model setting I will not touch, and there's a, an amazing paper you can read on this. Um, if you want to learn more about sort of the, the POC setting in this, uh, which I will do, but I will focus on the supervised learning framework. Um, and the first question is, how do we define a learning pool? What are the necessary components? So now there'll be a bit of definitions. Um, we need to fix an input space. We need to fix where uh, do our uh, inputs lie. And we need a parameter of scaling. We need something which sort of says you what is the instance size. And for this, we denote them as a curly X sub N, which can either be, you can think of them, or we will consider the cases where they're N bit strings or N dimensional real vectors. And as a label space, we'll just stick to binary classification. So there's two possible labels. Uh, a learning problem also has a target distributions, which tells you which of the inputs will appear with what probability. Uh, I write it down now, but throughout the talk, I'll kind of sweep it under the rug just to sort of keep the notation a bit more clear. But you should think about the learning problem is always given with a target distribution, which tells you which input you will receive and which input you will uh, have to predict on later. Uh, then the next part is the concept classes, which Jens already asked me about. These things want to be known beforehand and they will specify the problem. And concept classes, concepts themselves, are nothing more than binary valued functions on the input space, which I use this notation for. But in words, this means they're binary valued functions on the input space XM. And finally, we have the example Oracle, which is an Oracle, which in unit time, which in unit cost, outputs an example. And an example is simply just an evaluation of the concept. So X comma Y, where Y is the evaluation of the concept on X. Now that we've defined a learning problem, how are we going to tackle it? Well, we're going to define a learner, which also will consist of two components. Well, it also, which will consist of two components, also of multiple. At first, firstly, they will have a hypothesis class, which is again, nothing more than a family of binary valued functions on the input space. And secondly, you can think we have a learning algorithm, which is used to pick out the best hypothesis. So sort of intuitively, when we're doing machine learning in practice, when we have uh, we, we, we fix an hypothesis class, think about this as deep neural networks. It's a family of possible functions that you can use. And the learning algorithm simply tries to tune the weights to find out which specific instantiation of the deep neural network we will use for our problem. An intuition of PAC is that when given access to an example oracle, we want to use the learning algorithm to find a hypothesis, which is in some sense close to the concept which sort of generates the examples. Okay, that's intuitively, but now let's make it formal, I guess. Uh, and you see a big book, big definition. Let's try to chop it up in parts. What does it mean for a family of concept classes to be efficiently park learnable under some target distributions? Well, that means that there exists some hypothesis class and some learning algorithm with the following property. For every concept in my concept class and all possible error parameters, epsilon and delta, if my learning algorithm is given access to the example oracle corresponding to the concept and the error parameters, then it outputs a specification of an hypothesis that with probability at least one minus delta is close to the concept generating the examples. And by close, I really mean this particular equation here which says that if I sample a new input, then a probability less than epsilon, my hypothesis will agree with the concept. Uh, just a footnote is that the probability with the delta is really taken over the random examples that you get from the Oracle and the internal randomization of the learning algorithm. Whereas this probability here really is over the new examples that you're getting. And this is not standard park learning. This is efficient park learning. So additionally, we require that the learning algorithm must run in polynomial time in both the instance size and the error parameters. Note, since the Oracle is unit time, this also means that we can only query the Oracle a polynomial number of times. 
um, and also do calculations next to it, only a polynomial number of operations. So what do we mean by a specification? Just to sort of get so, this right. Yes. yes. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Just to, since you define an algorithm as an index set A, each A is a circuit. Yes, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and implicitly because of the last line, you you assume that it's a uniform family, right? There is a Turing machine which given n spits out A, mm -hmm. sub n, but you don't necessarily care about that right now. Is that the case? Okay. Yeah, no, I just see it as sort of for different instances, yeah, there's a universal Turing machine which for different instances outputs the other the algorithm and then you can apply this to uh, the problem at hand. Um, and it just has a polynomial runtime uh, uh, or size, let's say, if you want to think about it as circuit restriction. And yep, I mean, yep. and, and potentially, I mean, uh, I mean, you formulated the quantas that way around, but of course, epsilon and delta like are uniform in n, right? So that they are meant to be at the beginning, what to say? Yeah, but there's there's at the beginning there's for all everywhere, so I don't think there's there's no existing between, so it doesn't oh, yeah, matter yeah, the order, yeah, here, right? Good, it's for all, for all, for all. Yeah, yeah good, 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 good. Yeah, I had to uh, smile a bit because I have a, at 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 the uh, um, Ziefeld meeting I had a slide that was basically basically identical to your slide. <laughs> Never mind. No worries. And, um, okay, so let's just get this one pedantic thing out of the way. What do I mean by a specification? So I mean here that a priori beforehand we fix some enumeration scheme, which you can think of as nothing else than a function R, which maps bit strings to my hypotheses. So it's a way to write down my hypotheses to specify my hypotheses as a bit string. And by a specification, I mean a bit string such that when I apply my enumeration scheme, I get the hypothesis. But this is fixed beforehand. So we fix an enumeration scheme over our hypothesis class. And we want to output the one bit string that specifies the hypothesis according to this fixed enumeration scheme that we did a priori. Um, um, brief question. Yes. It makes sense to consider this to be countable because even if we knew that our functions were continuous, since we're only evaluating them on a finite set, namely bit strings, then effectively we'll have a finite number of hypotheses. Right? Uh, well, there, there can be infinite, but you mentioned countable, right? I think this is the more the, the distinction. Uh, so countably infinite or in count, uncountable infinite. Uh, no, but I mean, so even if my hypothesis class were like parameterized circuits, which is a continuous family, because yeah. the inputs can only be binary and like for a fixed length. Yeah, just use domain. floating point representation to get your weights then, I guess. That's one way to specify them as bit strings, right? Um, yeah. That's one way to get the continuous stuff from just the bit, from bit strings. Um, okay. Then it was just to clarify that this makes sense even in our case. Cool. Yeah, Thanks. okay. Yeah, good point. So indeed, you can also do real stuff with this, uh, continuous stuff with this, if you like consider floating point representations of these numbers of these weights. Um, and here we can, uh, for our case, since we are considering two, uh, two different types of computation, we can consider scenarios in which the learning algorithm is a quantum algorithm. So quantumly efficient or a learning algorithm, which is classically efficient, which gives us two sort of possible definitions, classically efficiently learnable and quantumly efficiently learnable. And these distinctions we'll try to make throughout the talk to see what's sort of possible here. Um, as mentioned, the hypothesis class is a very important component of the learning. Specifically, it can be cleverly adapted to the problem. So we don't want to impose unnecessary constraints. For instance, if we are dealing with pictures, then everybody loves using convolutional neural networks, which is like adapting your hypothesis class to the problem at hand. However, it turns out that we don't want to leave it entirely unconstrained either. Uh, and most importantly, we want to require, we demand it to be polynomially evaluatable. And I'll explain the reason for this later, but first let's get the definition out of the way. We say that the concept, we say that a hypothesis class is polynomially evaluatable. If there exists an evaluation algorithm that on input X and some specification of the hypothesis basically evaluates that hypothesis on the input X. And it does so in time polynomial in N. Um, again, here, since we're dealing with two different types of computations, we can make two different, we can make a distinction. We can make a distinction where the evaluation algorithm is classical, classically efficient, and we can make the distinction where the evaluation algorithm is quantumly efficient. 
So again, two, poss two possibilities here. So now let's turn to why it's so important to impose polynomial evaluatability. Well, it turns out that otherwise learning can be offloaded. And in particular, this means that your polynomial, polynomial efficiency of your learning algorithm becomes, vet, becomes sort of empty constraint. Let's do that in a bit more detail. And specifically, we have the following lemma. If we don't demand polynomial evaluatable, then anything which is learnable in super polynomial time is also learnable in polynomial time using a different hypothesis class, which will not be classically evaluatable, polynomially evaluatable, but it can still learn the original concept class. So let's try to see anything that is super polynomial learnable will also be polynomial time learnable if we don't impose the restriction. Um, and hence really this polynomial time thingy doesn't mean anything because it might as well have been super polynomial time. So just sketch a proof here. And I'm sketching this because this principle of offloading will, be, will, be, will come again in the presentation. And how do we show this? Well, we take a family, which is learnable in super polynomial time, and we're going to show that with a different hypothesis class, it's learnable in polynomial time using some different learning algorithm. OK, we construct them. OK, the hypothesis family that we're going to construct have hypotheses which are enumerated by all polynomial, polynomial sized sets of examples. And these are the hypotheses which are now indexed or enumerated by training sets a curly T simply simulates the original learning algorithm, which was super polynomial time on my training set T. And afterwards, simply simulates the hypothesis that this original super polynomial time learning algorithm would have outputted. And now with this hypothesis class, we can define an incredibly simple learning algorithm, which does nothing more than query a set of examples and then output a specification of the hypothesis in my new family that corresponds to this set of examples. What we've basically done is we've constructed a new hypothesis class, which takes as part also the training. So each hypothesis is specified by training set. It then runs the training algorithm on its training set and then outputs the hypothesis. By doing so, we can use a trivial, almost trivial learning algorithm, which is clearly polynomial time. However, the hypothesis class will be super polynomial time. So if we don't, um, impose, yes. Uh, sorry, what is what is curly T again? It's the sorry. Uh, the curly T here is the set of examples which corresponds to the hypothesis. So the hypotheses themselves are all enumerated by sets of examples, and this is one specific set of examples. I see. I guess uh, I would think that maybe a picture would have helped. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, no. So the, the hypotheses are all training, are all enumerated by different sets of examples. So here, this is basically one hypothesis that corresponds to one set of examples. And then on this set of examples, it runs the learning algorithm. And yep. it okay, it. I see. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe if I can add, this has to do with the question that Marcel asked. Yeah. Like, what do you mean by specifying a function, right? And what you're saying, well, a specification of function can be a code which may use as command super polynomial things. And simply writing down the code you can do in polynomial time, even the code represents a super polynomial function. Mm -hmm. So that way you can pre-concatenate, uh, or rather, was it prepend, uh, prepend a super polynomial computation, a universal one, to your hypothesis class, which is otherwise simple, right? And now, now the, the learner doesn't have to do anything, right? Just yeah, it seems like a bit, little bit vacuous, this sort of learning, because you have, you've only sampled and that's the answer now. Yep, exactly. So you can, um, yeah, so this, in order to avoid this sort of vacuousness, you impose that the hypothesis class is polynomially evaluatable to sort of eliminate this possibility of this, this trick, this example happening. Um, so that's why it's important to impose polynomial evaluatability in efficient puck or in computational learning theory i mean this reminds me strongly of like these um yeah for the problem you encounter when you do like information theoretic lower bounds and stuff like that where it's like the if the 
algorithm has like perfect information, you can always build a dictionary. That's essentially what we're doing here, right? You build a dictionary and then you just like, where you spend exponential time, build a dictionary and then uh, you're happy. And then at the point of learning, you just use like the dictionary. Yeah, exactly. Maybe like a look up the dictionary type stuff, yeah. But I'm also still unclear. Like usually I would think that people think about puck learning either in, in the proper setting where you really have to output a concept uh -huh. or in the agnostic setting where you learn, where you're supposed to learn a member of a predefined hypothesis class and you're not allowed to just output some new hypothesis class. Like, yeah, so like say, well, if you wanted to learn something with your neural network, then you wouldn't be allowed to output uh, some samples, right? Or, uh, I don't know. No, you're right. These settings are, are also studied and clearly relevant, but sort of in the computational learning theory setting, where you really want to see, does there exist an hypothesis class that allows me to solve this problem? Um, you can really try to think about finding the exactly right hypothesis class for your problem. And in this sense, it's free. But in two slides, I think I'll also explain that it's clearly relevant and also widely studied to really fix your hypothesis class. But throughout this talk, it will really this talk, it will really be a free component of the learner. I see. And it's both widely studied. Uh, I don't know which one is more widely studied, which one is more relevant. But in this scenario, in the computational learning theory, really in the efficient puck, um, just the problems we study are all about trying to find for any. Uh, statements that are like for any hypothesis class mm -hmm. um, and if you want such statements then these restrictions are important as this example shows all right thanks no worries um uh, to build on that question let's have a slide on it um we let the learner choose the hypothesis class so in a sense it's free um, and as I'll try to argue with you in this slide, this is clearly not covering any other relevant scenarios, uh, as it's sometimes useful to consider a fixed hypothesis class. For instance, suppose we want to learn sort what physical properties characterize phases of matters. Well, one way to formulate this is in terms of hypotheses, which are of the form H sub O, where O is now an observable, and beta are Hamiltonian parameters. And it basically evaluates some observable on the ground state of the Hamiltonian corresponding to beta. And one way to, uh, to think about this is we don't really want to evaluate these concepts. We just want to identify which observable when measured on the ground state will tell me about the phase of matter. These things are typically called order parameters. And in fact, these hypotheses are quantumly intractable to evaluate generally. They involve preparing ground states, which we all, uh, which is few may hard. Uh, um, and in this case, well, what do you mean by quantumly intractable to evaluate um, for the um, order parameter? Well, the, because it involves a process of preparing a ground state, which in, ah, which in I general know. is something oh, yeah, which yeah, is I not. I thought you meant the estimation of that. And I mean, is it? Is there any further constraint? I mean, is it like local or is it like a topological string-like order parameter? Is there anything else? On Notice that? this, um, the, the purpose of this example is that it can cover many examples that you okay. described. I'm trying to be as general as possible here. Wonderful. Uh, just to provide an example of a scenario where it also makes sense to fix the hypothesis class. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Such as in this case. Thank you. And the next point I want to make is that in this case, we see something which is not quantumly intractable, not polynomially evaluatable, yet it still makes sense why? Because the previous trick doesn't apply. We cannot change the hypothesis class. Since we fix the hypothesis class, this trick of changing the hypothesis class will not work. So this still gives you a well-defined scenario to study efficiency of learning algorithms. However, this is not what we study. <laughs> small, small caveat, unless I suppose the Hamiltonian family and observable are somehow universal computationally, right? Then I guess you might be in the same sort of boat as before. You mean uh, where ground state preparation is in BQP or in fact BQP complete? Well, when 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 your system is computationally universal, right? The, the, the measurement of properties of the ground state of the system as an input parameter is computationally universal, right? Then, then in principle, under Turing reductions, polynomial time Turing reductions, you can do whatever you want, including, yeah, super yeah, polynomial. It's, it's, it's more a completeness statement than a universal statement, right? Completeness means just it captures it, but it can also still be harder, I guess. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so this is just an example of this, this scenario we study is not all that there is. It's also interesting, like Marcel says, I think it was Marcel, sorry if it wasn't true, cases where the hypothesis clause is really fixed, uh, but this is not what we study. Okay, so based on the previous discussions, we can define four types of learners, namely learners where the learning algorithm is either classical or quantum, and learners where the evaluation algorithm is either classical or quantum. This gives rise to four categories of learning problems, namely learning problems that are efficiently learnable using a learning algorithm, using a polynomial time learning algorithm and a polynomial So, so Kasper, what's the difference between an uh, evaluation algorithm and the hypothesis class? It's this, well, the evaluation algorithm corresponds to hypothesis class. Evaluation algorithm is part of a hypothesis class. Uh, cool. I just choose to focus on the algorithm here because this is sort of what is quantum and what is classical. It's an hypothesis class with either a classical or a quantum polynomial time evaluation algorithm. Um, so it's really part of the hypothesis class here. Just like there's two components of the learners, learning algorithm and hypothesis, in this case, this is also the case, learning algorithm and hypothesis, but I write it really down here as evaluation algorithm, which is inherently part of the hypothesis. The first learning uh, category of learning problem I call CC, which is a classical learning algorithm and a classically polynomially time evaluatable hypothesis class. Please don't confuse this with sort of the CCQC notation where the, the C stands for the nature of the data and the nature of the learner. This is really about the first letter is the nature of the learning algorithm, and the second letter is the nature of the evaluation algorithm or the hypothesis class equivalent. We can go on, CQ, classical learn quantum evaluation, QC, quantum learner, classical evaluation, QQ. Both things are quantum. And since any quantum algorithm, sorry, <laughs> all the way around, since any classical algorithm can be efficiently simulated by a quantum algorithm, the other way around, Hopefully it's not possible. Um, there are some trivial inclusions, namely, I can raise any C to a Q. CC is contained in CQ. I can simulate my evaluation algorithm also as a quantum algorithm, and I can raise any C to a Q, as a Q, which gives rise to the following two change of trivial inclusions. However, there's also one non-trivial inclusion. Uh, so a priori, you think that there's four possible classes, but let's see. It turns out that if the evaluation algorithm is a quantum algorithm, then it doesn't matter whether I restrict the learning algorithm to be classical or quantum. And like I said, I did the proof previously for a reason. We're going to see it back. So you might expect why this holds. Um, the above statement you can summarize in a lemma, which basically says that anything which is QQ learnable so learnable with a quantum learning algorithm and a quantum hypothesis class or quantum evaluation algorithm is also learnable using a classical learning algorithm and a quantum uh, evaluation algorithm. And since on the previous slide, we saw that the trivial holds that I can raise any C to a Q, we in fact have equality. So the idea is the same. We can again offload the learning, but now we're not offloading all, we are, we are now offloading basically the quantum uh, part of the learner onto the quantum evaluation algorithm. So the setup is the same. We take a QQ problem, which has a quantum learning algorithm and a quantum polynomial evaluated by hypothesis class. And we will show that it is um, classically learnable with a classical learning algorithm, efficiently learnable with a classical learning algorithm and a quantum evaluation algorithm. So CQ, we begin with quantum learn and quantum hypothesis, QQ, and we move it into classical learn and quantum evaluation, CQ. Trick is all the same. We again consider the family of hypothesis H prime, who are all enumerated by sets of examples. We let an hypothesis, which has a corresponding set of examples, simply run the quantum learning algorithm on the training set, and we run the resulting hypothesis. And again, we have a very trivial classical polynomial time learning algorithm, which simply queries the example oracle a polynomial number of time, obtains a training set, and then outputs the hypothesis corresponding to this training set, which we've defined previously as something which does the original training, the original quantum training on my hypothesis class, which shows that this problem, which was a priori QQ, is in fact CQ as well, 
establishing equality of these two categories. So while a priori, one would think that there's four classes, actually there's only three, which turns out that there's only two ways to define what a learning separation is. Namely, a learning separation are now problems, and I have two types of separations, a CCQC separation, which is a problem that lies in QC. So it's efficiently solvable by a quantum learner with a classical hypothesis class, but it does not lie in CC. And we have a CCQQ separation, which is a problem that is inside QQ, but not inside CC. Um, maybe it's possibly a stupid question, but I asked it nevertheless at this point, which is um, how much of this relies on this being on function learning? I mean, would the same apply also to, to distribution learning, like pack distribution learning? It seems so, no? I mean, the same reasoning should work. We can also discuss this later. I was just wondering. Yeah, no, that must, I think so. I don't know what necessarily the efficiency is of the concept here. And so I guess the concept should be able to output a sample either quantumly or classically in polynomial time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think if you make such the same again, I think yes, the same okay. sort of collapse of the four to three holes. Yeah, I I think. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, and there's two types of separation, and let's briefly comment on what the differences are. Um, and arguably, I would say that a CCQC, sorry, a CCQQ separation, so where both the quant, the learner and the evaluation algorithm are quantum, can be, sorry, no, not all of them are, but they can be less about learning proper. So just to give an intuitive example here, we consider a very simple concept class a function f, which is classically intractable yet quantumly efficient. And let's again assume for simplicity also in the presence of data. Um, it's really simple concept plus. Picking out which one it should be, should be easy because there's only one. However, it's in fact not classically learnable in the CC part. Why? Because there will never be a classically evaluatable hypothesis class that is able to evaluate f, which would, as this would contradict the class contractability of the function. However, the quantum learning algorithm is completely trivial. It simply just picks out the f, uses the quantum algorithm for f, and it is an evaluation, and it is a QQ learner. This is different if we restrict to classically polynomial evaluatable hypothesis class. So if we look at CCQC separations, because in this case, such an example would disappear because this is also not QC learnable because we require the evaluation algorithm to be classical and the learning algorithm, just the learning algorithm can be quantum. And in this case, the quantum part is really used to identify the hypothesis and not also to later evaluate it. So in QQ, you use both a quantum algorithm to identify and evaluate Whereas in QC, you use a quantum algorithm to identify and then later a classical algorithm to evaluate. So really the identification is what the quantum part is used for in a CC-QC separation. And fortunately, in literature, there are examples of both. Um, so they're really um, uh, interesting. Um, so let's do these examples. Let's just sort of briefly go over them, what they are and uh, why one is a QQ and one is a QC. So the, the first one, which I think is uh, kind of well known, is the sort of the discrete logarithm concept class. Um, let's not get stuck up in too much detail here. Um, it's a, you uh, have a group, uh, modulo P multiplicative, uh, and uh, both the, the generator uh, and the prime are known to everybody. And uh, based on this group, we define a set of concepts, which are binary values, and first compute, or they uh, are one, if the discrete logarithm, which is a, you think about this, if you don't know what this is, it's the logarithm equivalent in the group. So we have a multiplicative group. So like the inverse of raising something to a power, but you should really think of this more if this doesn't make sense as a hard function. So it's a discrete logarithm of X and you have to decide whether or not this is in some interval or not. So you first apply a hard function and then decide the output of this is in an interval. Um, what Leo et al showed is quite impressively that it's actually 
not just le efficiently learnable in QQ, but also by a general purpose algorithm. So really the well-known quantum kernel method is able to efficiently learn this. However, a quantum kernel method is a quantum kernel method. So you need a quantum algorithm to evaluate it, which puts it in QQ. And it's unclear if this is also doable with a classically efficient hypothesis class. So can we drop the quantum? Can we get something where really the quantum, where you need a quantum algorithm to learn and later a classical algorithm to evaluate? And this is still an open question whether or not this is also a CCQC separation. And not, and turns out that you, is, this is not NCC, as this would violate discrete logarithm assumption. I'm being uh, vague on accident here because the second part of this talk will be about how to establish such a statement, how to establish not learnability based on some complexity theoretical assumption. Now, since this is a QQ separation, Let's also study a QC separation. And I see I dropped the, the C here. It should be CCQC separation. And this is the cube root concept class, which was known um, by Servideo and Gertler. Oh, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's the following concept class. We again fix an n bit integer n, which is now a product of two equally sized primes. And the integer n is known, but P and Q are not. Think about RSA, if that makes sense. And the concept class are defined implicitly as the inverse of raising something to the power of three. So really the cube root, but again, in the multiplicative group modulo N. So the concept I on input X computes the inverse of X to the power of three of X cubed, so the cube root. And then you take the I've bit of it. And interestingly, why is this QC learnable? Well, fortunately by number theory, we know that this function, this inverse is of a very specific form. It's nothing more than raising X to some power again, where the power only depends on N. So what we can do is we can fix this hypothesis class, which is just taking X, raising it to some power D, which is efficient, using the, uh, what's it called, square and multiply method. And then you take the i-th bit. This is classically polynomially evaluatable. And in fact, we can use Shor's algorithm to compute this d star. Uh, it's a sort of a standard attack on RSA for people who want to know details. Um, we can use Shor's algorithm to compute this d star and then look at which i, which bit basically fits the data the best which will give us a QC learner. And again, this is not in CC, since this would violate a complexity theoretical assumption. And again, I'm being uh, vague on purpose because this is gonna be the second part of the talk, how would we establish a learning algorithm based on some complexity theoretical assumption. But before we do so, I want to make one brief intermezzo to sort of reflect on what the sources of learning hardness can be. We saw two examples now. In the first example, the hardness simply came from the fact that the concepts were too hard to evaluate classically, even in the presence of data. But arguably, this is more about a computational separation, less about learning. The hardness really came from the fact that evaluating is hard, not identifying is hard. In the second part, we saw that there was some weird obfuscation going on. The concepts were specified in a way that don't allow for efficient evaluation. However, there exists a different specification that does allow for efficient evaluation, which in the cube root concept class were this. If I vaguely specify or implicitly specify it as the inverse of some function, then it turns out not to be efficiently learnable, not to be efficiently evaluatable. However, if I specify it as the i-th bit of this relatively simple function, then it turns out to be efficiently evaluatable. So the source of the hardness really was a sort of an obfuscation of the specification of the concepts. And finally, there's also a third possibility. Namely, the concepts can just be efficiently evaluatable, but the hardness really lies in identifying. To, to the best of my knowledge, no such separation exists, though I don't think it's impossible. 
because there still exists families of efficiently evaluatable concept class, such as polynomially sized logarithmical depth Boolean circuits, which are not efficiently learnable classically. Each instance is sufficiently evaluatable, yet the family is not efficiently learnable. So pointing out is really the hard part. However, it turns out that these things are also not quantum learnable by a result by Srinivasan et al. Uh, because the intuition for this is that they also contain quantum hard functions still. Uh, and it's an open question of whether you can sort of balance this, whether you can find a family of concept classes which are efficiently evaluatable, yet not classically learnable, but still quantum learnable. Uh, you, you don't want to make it too big like this because then you lose quantum learnability. And you don't want to make it too small because then maybe it becomes classical learnable again. Uh, but it's not impossible. Okay, so now let's get back to the question, how do we deduce hardness from computational complexity? Um, and um, this is the approach that we take in this, in this note, or because um, this is the approach of the previous existing examples. We want to deduce hardness of learning from a certain computational complexity assumption. That's sort of the approach we take. But as I mentioned, there's two major challenge, challenges. Access to examples can radically enhance what learning can evaluate. Moreover, we only have to be correct on a fraction of inputs, as opposed to the worst case of normally studied in computational complexity. However, let's think in solutions. What happens if the examples are efficiently generatable? In this case, the existence of an efficient classical learner implies the existence of an efficient non-learning algorithm. Why? Well, suppose we have an efficient uh, classical learner. Then what we can do is we can write down an algorithm which simply efficiently generates examples and then applies the learner on these examples and we have an output. This is now a non-learning algorithm because it generates examples by itself. It's, a, it's simply an algorithm. And hence we can use complexity theory assumptions now again. This is one way to get around the fact that examples relatively enhance what a learner can evaluate. And um, to get around this worst case uh, requirement, we have to study the less, we have to consider the less studied area of heuristic complexity. Complexity of problems where you have to be correct on a fraction of inputs. Okay, so now uh, the final big slide um, is what, how can we capture these two observations in a checklist of requirements that allows us to overcome the challenges that we discussed in the previous slide. And well, we do this. i interrupt you for just one moment. Uh, can yes. you please give some intuitive explanation as to why the hardness of learning is reduced to this uh, assumption on the discrete block problem. Um, why I chose to, so this is really an approach I use. This is not the only way there is, but this is the approach I'm trying to capture. Sure, uh, but, but what's the intuitive reason for why this works? Um, I guess that will become clear in the next slide where I'm trying to sort of see how one would do this. Um, <laughs> the next slide will try to give, the, Please ask me the question after the next slide if it's not if it's not clear yet. Right. Okay. Um, so um, to answer that question, um, we first suppose we can decompose our concepts in the following way. So given the concept class, we are trying to find a decomposition in the following way, and we say that if this decomposition satisfies the following criteria, then you are guaranteed to exhibit the separation based on the approach we take. And I hopefully the intuition becomes clear on how this is established when we go over a proof sketch. So what are the uh, criteria that we have to satisfy? Well, examples have to be efficiently generatable in order to turn a learner into a non-learning algorithm. Moreover, we require some hardness. We require some separation between what classical computers can and what quantum computers can. So we demand that the inverse of G is heuristically hard. So in other words, there does not exist a classical algorithm with a polynomial runtime that is correct on a fraction of inputs, on an epsilon fraction of inputs, and it has to scale inverse polynomial in epsilon. And finally, we, re we require that the capacity to heuristically evaluate the concepts 
also implies the capacity to heuristically evaluate the inverse of G. And these three components will make it such that we can turn a computational complexity assumption into a hardness of learning, which hopefully becomes clear when we go over the proof sketch. And finally, we still have to show that it's quantumly efficiently learnable. And for this, we require that G inverse is quantumly heuristically evaluatable. So in other words, there does exist a quantum algorithm that satisfies equation two. And moreover, the function, the family F has to be efficiently quantum learnable. Um, and like I made a big deal about two types of different uh, separations. And um, this checklist captures both. I didn't want to put all the details in the checklist here, but what kind of separation appears really depends whether or not F has sort of an efficiently computable description that allows it to be efficiently evaluated classically. Think about the back door. Think about this D star. Does there exist a D star that makes F, that makes G inverse, sorry, this would be G inverse, uh, efficiently evaluatable. Um, the checklist should cap does capture the two different uh, types of separations, but let's just say for simplicity now, there exhibits a separation. If you want more details, I refer to the paper here. Um, and it's important to note that our decomposition consists of two parts, with part F, which really turns this into a learning problem, and the function G, which causes the classical quantum separation to appear. So now, uh, to give some intuition on how to establish uh, learning separations based on computational complexity, let's go over a proof sketch. And we want to first show that no classical learner can efficiently learn the concepts. So suppose it can. Suppose there does exist a classical learner and we will show a contradiction. Well, since examples are efficiently generatable, this means that we can turn this classical learner into a heuristic algorithm by simply first generating examples and then applying the learner. So by one, we can turn our efficient classical learner into an efficient heuristic classical algorithm for the concepts. And now by three, since we have the capacity to heuristically evaluate the concepts, this would also give us the capacity to heuristically evaluate G inverse. So there exists a heurist efficient heuristic classical algorithm for G inverse. Well, this is a contradiction to requirement two. Since a priori we assumed as our computational complexity result, our assumption that there does not exist such an inverse, such a classical heuristic algorithm for the inverse. So this is why these three ingredients give rise to classical intractability of okay. learning. Kasper, just a small sanity for me. Uh, sure. G is not a binary function, right? No, G is not a, no, yeah. correct. Then, then F then, turns then, into then, a binary then, function. Then, then um, three should actually be for all concepts in the concept class, not just one concept. Yeah, right? there should be a quantifier there. Yes, I should have said that. Yes, for any C, yes. No, for all. No, yes, you, no, you have to, you have to any, if, you can, if, if you can heuristically evaluate every senior concept class, then you can yes. evaluate G inverse, right? Because it kind of reads out every yes. bit. Yeah, good. For instance, yeah, so you should think about this function F, for instance, as taking the i bit of G, such as in a discrete logarithm case. Um, I will give an example of F in the, in the next slide. Um, I will give an example of an application first, but let's first quickly go over why. I had, a question. I had a question Please, yes, on the previous yes. um, proof sketch. Why do you call it heuristic classical algorithm? Or like, what does it mean of heuristically learning something? Uh, good question. So um, in normally an algorithm has to be correct on all inputs. Um, but now I'm saying it's a heuristic algorithm, which means that it has a runtime which kills this polynomial on the instance size and some precision parameter epsilon. And it has to output an output which is correct only on an epsilon fraction of inputs. This is what I mean by heuristics. Okay, thank you. Just to add, there's an underlying distribution that we don't talk yeah, about. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, there's this target distribution, which I uh, don't want to clutter my slides even more by dealing with this. But this really is, there's a specification of a distribution over which you have to be correct on an absolute fraction. <laughs> you said earlier that you would leave it out to, to make that um, that simpler. And now we are discussing the problems. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's always the case. You try to Can't simplify, it, but then in the end. <laughs> 
Um, so I think your proof sketch basically answered my question. As to yeah. What so like you reduce the uh, learning problem to an algorithmic problem and you evaluate it in computational complexity land. But I suppose uh, if I might ask an addendum question, can you always take a learning algorithm and translate it into a complexity problem? Or is uh, there a specific assumption underlying the no, this is Yeah, this is the way we do it is really underlying the fact that the examples are efficiently generated, which is generally not the case. But but we this do have not, we do have some results beyond that, right? We would mention those. I'm gonna mention those, yes, okay. but this is not, I think, necessarily related to uh no, wait, it is. Okay, yeah. So later we have a different way as well uh, of uh, relating hardness of learning to hardness of computation. Okay, uh, but, but, so, just but, so, but so far the assumption is efficiently generative. Yes. Okay. In this checklist, yes, correct. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so for the interest of time, uh, I had an example of why this recipe works or why this checklist works on a discrete logarithm case. Um, you can find it in the paper. There turns out to be a, a, a decomposition uh, as follows, where F is simply just an interval classifier and G is sort of the inverse of the discrete logarithm or raising it to the power. Um, and it turns out that, um, am I allowed to go over time here? Is this really, uh, because otherwise I would do it more slowly here. I don't Considered know what people prefer. Time. Sorry? Considered polite to go slightly over time. Okay. Uh, I will do it slightly then. Okay, so let's do this uh, in slightly more detail than I originally attended. Um, so why in this case are the uh, examples efficiently generatable? The reason for this is that the forward evaluation of both F and G are efficient. G is simply raising some fixed number A to a power for which we have the square and multiply method. So G, is, G itself is efficient, Yet G inverse is classically intractable. It's sort of an important here. It's a one way type function in cryptography. Uh, and F is simply just an interval classifier. It's really, really simple. And why does this apply efficient generation of examples? Well, we can, since both F and G are efficiently evaluatable, we can generate this tuple G comma F. And it turns out that we can rewrite this tuple. If we denote Y equals G of X, then this tuple is equal to y comma f of g inverse y. But our concepts were basically f of g inverse. So in other words, an, a tuple of the form gx comma fx is nothing more than a valid example y comma cy. So in this case, since both f and g are efficiently computable, we can also efficiently generate examples. Note that the hardness lies in inverting g, not in going there, not going towards it, but really inverting G is the hard part. Um, under the uniform distribution, because this is bijective. Yeah, again, I didn't okay. want to clutter <laughs> everything with distributions, but there's distributions underlying this. And if you cross your eyes and put your teeth and you get much notation, but you should worry about the, the distribution. I mean, the, the key point, you don't get to choose example Y comma C of I for a chosen Y. Yes, correct. That is you don't get to choose your Y, yes. but you can make it uniform at random. Yeah. Uh, the second requirement that the function is heuristically hard. Um, and like I said, fortunately, this statement here, verbatim, is nothing more than what cryptographers or complexity theorists call the discrete logarithm assumption, which verbatim states that there is no classical algorithm which can invert this on a fraction of inputs. Which not, not something, not, there does not exist a function that can invert this, that does not exist an algorithm which can invert this on a fraction of inputs. So two, we're done with that as well. We have the discrete logarithm assumption. And finally, we should check that the capacity to heuristically evaluate the concepts gives us the capacity to heuristically evaluate G inverse. And like Vedran mentioned previously, we have to have this capacity to do so for all the possible concepts. And what we can do is we can choose I according to like a binary search scheme where we first determine does G inverse, uh, does the logarithm lie in an interval? Uh, if yes, then we chop this interval in half by considering a different interval. And then we see, does it lie on the left or to the right? And we keep repeating this until we pinpoint exactly where the discrete logarithm lies, where the inverse of G lies. 
So by varying my eye, by choosing it cleverly, um, I should have a picture here again, uh, sort to the person. Um, but by choosing I cleverly, we can sort of pinpoint exactly where G lies in my, uh, um, um, by choosing intervals and chopping that one in half, et cetera, et cetera. So here, this is also satisfied. Um, is it heuristically evaluatable? Yes, Schur's algorithm does it, even in the worst case. So it's even stronger than that. Schur's algorithm for the discrete logarithm is able to evaluate the discrete logarithm. And finally, F is clearly efficiently learnable because it's so simple. It's just a family of interval classifiers. So moving on to that question, uh, sorry, I forgot your name shows up. Um, we, it, to get this reduction to work from learning hardness to computational hardness, we require that examples are efficiently generated. And this is actually sort of a problem. Namely, it's often said that quantum machine learning advantages arise when the data comes from a quantum process. And if the data comes from a quantum process, then generally no classical efficient example generation is possible. Because in order to generate an example, you need to run the quantum process, which if we believe uh, Feynman, we should use a quantum computer for this and not a classical computer for this. So how do we enforce classical intractability of learning without this? Well, the trick here is that we use even harder functions. We just use even harder functions, so hard that examples won't even help. And what does this mean? I like to do complexity theory again. Well, fortunately, there is a class that fits this. Namely, we consider functions which are outside the class your p slash poly. It's a kind of an exotic class, but it's a class nonetheless. It's the class of functions that are not heuristically solvable. And by heuristically solvable, I really mean, again, on a fraction of inputs. But now we're also getting a polynomially sized advice string, which is what it's called in complexity theory. But for us machine learning, we can just think about this advice string as the best possible training data we could get. The training data, which perfectly captures everything that we need to know about the problem. And since we have an, in, um, we give this as an advice string. So we can get around the class, the, the efficient example generation by considering even harder functions. Functions, no matter what training data I give it, will not be able to be inverted heuristically in polynomial time. Um, okay, we can just go beyond the existing examples, the existing examples being the discrete log and the cube root, in which case the data was efficiently generatable by dropping the previous requirement and using even harder functions. Uh, so we get a second and final checklist, um, which again, we decompose the our concept class into a learning part. Wait, can, I ask, can I ask a very uh, pedantic question? Please um, do. I feel as if in the definitions I have seen of the P poly concept class, yes. the right string has to be constant for all like problems in the class. But if you're saying that the advice string is a training data, it's not going to be the same string for all problems in the class. Um, it's going to be the training data um, for all problems. In, so for all instance sizes and not different instances. Um, yeah. So what does it mean? If I want to evaluate, uh, if I, okay, uh, let's bring this to machine. Um, if I have pictures of dogs, uh, then there is an advice string of training data of cats and dogs, which sort of perfectly captures if it's a cat or a dog, which allows you to learn the difference. And this is a fixed training data, which allows you to value. So while it's fixed for sort of the family pictures, if I get a new picture, it's the same training data. So sort of the for different instances, uh, the training, the, the string shouldn't change, but for the instant size, it has to be fixed. Uh, so it cannot depend on X, it can just depend on the instant size of the problem here, if that makes any sense. No, no, that makes total sense. But I guess like my question is whether it's fair to model training data as an advice string, because uh, it, data changes every time. Uh, yes, okay, that's a very good point. And actually I want to refer you to the appendix of power of data by uh, Robert Wang or uh, Didi, where he explains this. So you can sort of de-randomize the training data using what is called Adelman's trick. Uh, to get really sort of a, a perfect training data, which is like fixed. Um, Adelman's theorem is a way to sort of de-randomize computation based on polynomial advice. 
And this can also be applied to sort of de-randomized training data. I see. So there's okay. sort of, there is one way to uh, get over And the de-randomization doesn't increase the length of the... It like, does, but not by, by only a polynomial uh, oh, thingy, but using very okay. good probability theory bounds. Uh, Cool. I think it's even union bound, so it's not that good, but <laughs> the standard things apply here. So it's called Adam Wants Trick, and it's nicely discussed in the uh, appendix of uh, Power of Data and Quantum Machine Learning is the title of the paper, Nature Communications. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, so one additional thing. Uh, so previously when you were uh, you were dealing with a discrete log assumption, mm -hmm. you were talking about taking functions that lie outside this uh, class here, p slash poly. Mm -hmm. So the functions that you take outside of this class, like, are you also, uh, are, are they, is it also based on complexity theoretic assumptions or do you have some guarantees that these functions are indeed? Uh, no, the complexity theoretical assumption would be that these lies outside your P slash poly. I see. I see. And it can either be a theorem or an assumption, but this is sort of the basis of your learning separation. It can either be something provable or something we believe holds. Um, I see. And just, is there any reason that you're doing this in the relativized world? Because you're assuming access to a poly string, right? Yeah, well, the poly string basically takes the role of the training data. I see. Um, I see. I see. So this is so, why I have to, but it's, it's even so, in this press, yeah. So maybe do it. I mean, so if you cannot do it with an arbitrary God given poly string, then you certainly <laughs> cannot do it with training data. I see. Okay. Not yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, now kicking out the efficient data generation and replacing it with this even harder function, we get a new recipe, which for class contractability of learning, we demand that this lies outside the complexity class, ERP slash poly. And again, we need this sort of reduction that the capacity to heuristically evaluate C will also give you the capacity to heuristically evaluate G inverse. Um, and the quantum, Efficient learnability has to be guaranteed by we can infer G still in BQP. So G is a specific function which lies outside your P slash poly, but inside BQP, you still need to enforce quantum learnability. You don't want it to be too hard for even that part. And again, the function F has to be a very simple class, which is just efficiently quantum learnable. It's a simple class. Um, and interestingly, this new checklist, which also gives a rise to approval separation, deals with the setting where data comes from a quantum process. So sort of enriches the kinds of separations that one can one is able to prove with such checklist. So uh, what have we learned? Or what have we hopefully learned? Um, learning separations between cl with classical data are far and few between. Subtle changes in definitions came in conceptually different things, leading to a separation existing or no separation at all. So it's hard to define these things. Moreover, proving them is rather cumbersome. There's many things to worry about, exist the existence of training data, heuristic complexity, yada, yada. And we try to provide a checklist that sort of allows you to more easily check, more relatively more easily check whether or not your concept classes fit and learning separations are able to deal with all these challenges that arise. Um, and able to streamline one's approach or elaborate bottlenecks, sort of what do you need to ensure additionally to really get a learning separation? And I want to thank Fedron uh, for working with me on this note, on this paper. And I want to thank you all for having me uh, talk about my uh, my paper here. <laughs> Wonderful, that was great. Absolutely um, inspiring and like <laughs> very close to our, our hearts and thinking. Um, we had lots of questions along the way. Um, is there more? <laughs>